<laughs> I think I'll be changing my background throughout our meeting today. Gosh, love that. Love that. <laughs> getting these. <laughs> Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I know this is just kind of a time of pure chaos in the world, so I really appreciate everybody taking an hour, and hopefully that this will be a good, um, change of topic and change of mindset for all of us, considering everything that's going on. Um, and yeah, I don't want to take up too much time, so I want to turn it over to our presenters. Should we introduce ourselves first? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so hi, my name is Sonia Rosen. I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education, and I work in a program called the Independent Schools Teaching Independent School Teaching Residency Program. Um, and I've also been a researcher, uh, like researching mainly youth organizing, um, but also teacher activism as well um, for the last I don't know long time 11 or 12 or more years I don't know and um and I've known Ben for quite a while as well oh. but we are across the country from each other so I live in Philadelphia and that's where I am now and I'll just use that as my transition to let Ben introduce himself sure um that sounds good thanks I actually wanted to show everybody give me a second here um I wanted to show everybody the book that Sonia um, edited. Okay. I'm going to screen share my screen for a second. Um, it's called Contemporary Youth Activism Advancing Social Justice in the United States. It's got a lot of good chapters in there. Edited with uh, Jerusha Connor and Sonia Rosen, mm -hmm. so I recommend it. And Ben has some great books as well. <laughs> I don't have screenshots of them right now, but... Um, but it's nice to join you all. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks for your work on this, Megan and Kate, for inviting us. Um, I'll, I'll defer to whatever your routines are as a group. So I don't know if you want to everybody introduce themselves, whatever you typically do makes sense. But I'll just briefly say that my name is Ben Kirshner. I'm a um, professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm really uh, honored to be with all of you. I'm excited to hear um, you know what some of your questions are and a little more about student voice but I know that we are going to start out with with a, a bit of a presentation just to frame the work because that was what was asked of us um, and I also like Sonia have been studying youth organizing and activism um, over the past 15 to 20 years or so and um, I started out as a youth worker so I worked in a youth organization in San Francisco if anybody on the call is from the Bay Area we can talk about that but I got really curious about um, organizing as a context for young people's learning, but also for social change, because it just so happened that when I was doing that work, which was in the 1990s, there was quite a bit of um, organizing among youth to fight back against certain policies in California. Because 20 years ago, in California, it was actually controlled by Republicans. So it was a very different climate there. And, um, and so anyway, but it fueled a lot of youth movement. So I started out back then, and since then I've been doing a lot of work in Colorado, both in and out of school. I'll stop there, but I'm happy to be with you all. And I wore my these glasses today just to look more professorial. You look very professorial, Ben. Thank you. Thank so, you so much for um, introducing yourselves. You guys can go right ahead with okay. your presentation, and then we'll start our chat afterwards for a second. Okay, great. So Ben, I'm planning this call or this uh, webinar or whatever it is. Um, we were talking about kind of offering you an overview of the landscape of um, sort of youth civic engagement and then thinking more deeply about youth organizing. So we split it up for me to give a little bit of an over engagement. And then Ben is going to um, sort of get us deeper into the, the concept of youth organizing and uh, some examples um, and he'll expand on a little bit of expand and deepen and, and uh, expand on and deepen what I'm talking about. So um, I think you asked us to speak for 10 minutes each ish, right? Um, but uh, I'm terrible at just speaking for 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to have a little stopwatch, uh, which I have not started yet. So I've not started my 10 minutes. But um, once I do start it, I will hope to stick to about 10 minutes, but I might go a little over. But so Ben, Sounds good. No worries. Anybody feel free to jump in, you know, get your hook to pull me off the stage or whatever. 
Um, so uh, I was thinking about how to frame this and how to be thinking about youth civic engagement as a, as a sort of broad category. It's a, such a broad field and people who study youth civic engagement and people who are doing youth civic engagement are off are engaged in quite a wide range of ways of thinking about it and practicing it. So I wanted to start um, uh, by talking a little bit about citizenship and um, and the notion of, of what it means to be a citizen of a community. Um, so I'm going to do a little screen share real quick. Um, and um, oops, here we go. Uh, and oops, it's not letting me here we go. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the communities that we're a part of, right? So whenever I teach classes on this, I like to have people think about what it means to be part of these imagined communities that we're that we um, that we're all parts of. Um, and so uh, the the notion of imagined communities this this term comes from um, Benedict Anderson. Uh, from a long time ago. It's been around for quite a while. And it's it's one that I like to think of as sort of at the heart of civic engagement. Um, and so um, just imagine for yourself, like how many different communities you're a part of, right? So you know that you are yourself, right? That's not really a community, but it's yourself. But you're also part of a family, right? Um, maybe during this uh, quarantining period, you have been very close to your family. Who knows, I have maybe a little too close. Um, we're also part of a neighborhood, right? We think of ourselves as part of a, a broader community outside of our household. Um, we might be part of a city or state. We might be part of a country, a region, part of the world. We might not think of it geographically. We might think of it in other ways. We might think of it in terms of the community of, of our profession or other identity groups that we're part of, right? So um, this conception of, of what it means to be part of these communities is really at the heart of citizenship, right? Because it's, it's this concept of, a, of what are the widening circles of influence, right? That we, that we um, are engaged with, right? And, um, and so the question I like to think of when we're thinking about how we understand ourselves as citizens is what do I conceptualize as a civic sphere that benefits me and to which I, I should be held accountable? Right, so it's back to that like rights and privileges, very sort of simplistic notion of citizenship, but it's kind of pretty basic and it works, right? So, um, and there's much more complex ways of thinking of citizenship, but I'm just going to use that for this. Um, and so, I just would love for all of you to think about that that question for yourself, right? So what what do I conceptualize as a civic sphere or spheres that benefits me and to which I should be held accountable? I should uh, to which I should be accountable, right? Um, and there is a really useful, um, a really useful framework for thinking about this um, that comes out of Westheimer and Kahn. Um, and uh, Westheimer and Kahn were two are two uh, researchers that um, created this framework for thinking about uh, like civic identity or or the kind of citizenship that you are. And it, it's really been like most work in this field has been based on this framework in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, people sort of refer to this as like. It's like the go-to framework, right? And um, they were working with young people. It came out of their research with young people. And um, they talk about three different types of citizen, citizens. That you, can be, um, you can be a personally responsible citizen. And, if, and I'd love to use the coronavirus moment as a way to think about this, right? Because it's in all of our minds. Um, you know, the personally responsible citizen acts responsibly. You know, they don't, they don't break the rules. They, you know, they do what they're being asked to do when they're asked to do it, you know? So in, with the coronavirus, you know, you see people like hunkering down, not going to their bars, not going, to, not going out, staying with their, in their houses, um, you know, not spreading the virus, not getting the virus, but probably, probably looking out for themselves on some level, right? The participatory citizen um, is, you know, somebody who is an active member of maybe community agencies, right? They may be the person who is like, jumping in and, you know, organizing the food drive, or maybe they are, you know, making sure, you know, organizing people's uh, collective response, you know, um, to sort of put a, to address the, the manifestations of a problem, right? So in, in this case, you know, maybe it's like in our neighborhood, some, some of us are like, uh, how can we um, get groceries for our elderly neighbors who should not be going to the grocery store or something like that, right? Whereas we're taking some leadership, we're being participatory, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to think about ourselves collectively, but we're not necessarily addressing the root cause of the problem, 
the people who are addressing the root cause of the problem are the social justice oriented citizens, right? The justice oriented citizens. And these are folks who are really thinking deeply about like what is causing this problem in the first place and how can we organize collectively to change it, right? And so um, those are people who, you know, in this case, in this uh, pandemic, they might be the folks who are, um, you know, doing all the organizing to advocate for governments to shut down or for, um, or for folks to get mortgage relief or for people to, uh, or for, you know, to change our, the way our economy works or something like that, right? So um, there's all these sort of ways that, that they're thinking about how do I address the root cause of this problem? Now, none of us is necessarily like just one or the other, probably. You might be just a personally responsible citizen, but you're probably not just a justice-oriented citizen. Probably if you're justice-oriented, you're also like picking up trash on your block or something like that too. You know, it's not just, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're really useful categories to think about the way we understand our work as civic actors in this, in this landscape. Um, so I wanted to think now to move into this idea of civic engagement. So as citizens, we engage with our world. We engage with our, the civic landscape around us, right? Um, and so civic engagement is really this concept of engaging with our civic spheres in ways that you know, acknowledge our accountability to a public um, or a collective outside of ourselves, right? So in order to think of ourselves as being civically engaged, we must be, we have to like be imagining that there's some public out there, that there's some sort of collective that needs us, you know, that needs all of us to be acting as citizens, as, as helpful citizens to do something to make it better, right? And to keep it running. Um, and in this, this field of civic engagement, it's tricky, right? Because um, there's this, we could talk about civic engagement as just being like engaged with a civic sphere, which could be like, institutions, it might be nonprofits, it might be, you know, schools, it could be all, all the sort of, um, all the civic institutions that make up our world, right? Could be neighbor organizations, whatever. Um, and then some people talk about it as political, and if you talk about something different, which would be political engagement, which might be like engaging with the politics or, or um, thinking critically about power or, um, you know, uh, engaging with power structures to uh, either keep things running or make change. Um, so we could talk about civic engagement and political engagement is different, and, I, and, and you know, certainly I often do. Um, and, but for the purposes of this, we're just gonna sort of think of it as civic engagement as one broad category, um, because a lot of times that's what the literature does. Um, uh, also, it's how it gets talked about in schools, how it gets talked about in curriculum in, um, you know, sort of among politicians and stuff. Um, I will say that when I talk about youth civic engagement, typically folks who talk about youth civic engagement are talking about folk, people who are up to the age of about 24-ish um, and doing civic engagement. So that's what we're talking when that's what we're referring to. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit now about some different dimensions of civic of youth civic engagement. So um, civic engagement. There's, there, these, are not, these are not all the dimensions of it, but these are some dimensions I felt were pretty important to think about, especially as we're, if we're gonna talk about youth organizing afterwards. Um, so civic engagement could be individual, right? Back to like, I could just be a volunteer and be like helping people out. Or it can be collective, where I'm working collectively with others to ensure that some policy gets changed or some, uh, you know, something changes in our in our society or something works better in our society. It could be in school or out of school. Um, it could be youth-led or youth-centered, or it could be in partnership with adults or, or led by adults. Um, and it could be more normative or, or engagement that sort of upholds the status quo, or it could be more critical or engagement that challenges the status quo, right? Um, and none of these, again, are are really mutually exclusive categories. Um, you know, a, a lot of civic engagement, a lot of youth civic engagement actually combines these things, or it's, we could see them as a spectrum. Um, but I wanna talk about, I wanna use that first category, this individual versus collective, um, to think about some different examples of what could be some individual forms of civic engagement and what might be some collective forms of civic engagement. And then to, under, to look at those other categories in relation to those examples. So. Um, so, for instance, so individual 
examples. A lot of you have probably done service learning in your in your high school classes or something, right? Um, I remember in my high school, it was a long time ago, it was in like the early 90s, and I was, uh, I was, um, do, like, there was these like clubs, after school clubs that had us do service learning. Now a lot of times service learning is incorporated in the curriculum. Service learning is typically, you know, the intention is not to make some large scale like systemic change, it's to address some specific need, like in the community, it might be feeding people who are homeless, it might be, um, it might be, you know, taking care of animals that have been uh, that have been abused or something, right? Um, so it's not it's not necessarily critical in the sense of how Westheimer and Kahn would talk about a justice oriented citizen thinking about the root causes of problems. Um, it's typically done. It's usually led by adults or at least in partnership with adults, and it's typically done. It could be done in school or out of school, right? Sometimes there are there are organizations that facilitate service learning. Um, and there is also, you know, in school, like in school, it's often part of a curriculum. Um, voting is another example of a more individual form of civic engagement. Um, now, voting, I think, is there's a real question this in this election right now about whether voting is actually a critical act or a normative act. Um, and I think that's something that's up for debate. I would not, I don't know if I have a full, a full perspective on that. Um, uh, it's certainly done out of school. You don't vote in school typically. And, um, you know, it, it, voting is an interesting thing because voting is uh, a, did somebody ask something? Oh, okay. Voting is, uh, is you're, you're, you're considered an adult by the time you can vote, right? So it's an interesting space where somebody who might be considered youth in every other area of their lives, you know, as college students, as, you know, youth civic actors in different ways, is suddenly considered an adult, and that gets to a lot of questions about how we construct, what's the construction, social construction of childhood in this, in this society. Um, critical service learning is another example. So um, whereas like service learning would typically be, um, you know, a, a individual act that would not be super critical, it would be like going into, um, you know, volunteer somewhere. Um, critical service learning really gets people to examine their own uh, their own positionality, their own um, identities and beliefs. It also gets them to think about being in partnership with the folks that they're serving, rather than uh, rather than simply having a one way one unidirectional relationship. Um, so, critical service learning is, I would say, a more critical form of civic engagement. Again, it's often directed still by adults. Sometimes it's not. There are, there are times when in out of school service learning activities where young people are actually doing a lot of the, the guidance and um, it can be done in school or out of school again, right? Um, so I wanna transition to some collective examples. So those were all individual examples where somebody is like really seeing themselves as a lone civic actor sort of doing their part to help, right? Collectively, there's a lot of other forms of civic engagement. And this is where I'm gonna sort of challenge even the construct that I've brought over. Um, up till now, I've really been talking about civic engagement as um, something that we do when we have a more social justice oriented perspective. Even if we're participatory citizens, you know, we have a particular way of, of constructing like what good means, right? Um, but I, you know, in social movement, people who study social movements, they study social movements that are like leftist movements, and they also study really right-wing social movements um, and other things in between. So I wanna sort of bring up three different um, forms of collective civic engagement that I think are really meaningful here. Um, one would be sort of what the thing that Ben is gonna talk about um, in, in a little bit, um, that's like grassroots organizing for social justice. So people at the bottom, people who are really the, um, ex experiencing the world from a very marginalized perspective um, and from whose experiences tend to be marginalized um, are the ones, uh, you know, advocating for something different, for, for change, right? And they might be, they're advocating for social justice, right? Um, but there's different ways of doing that kind of organizing, right? So that's not the only, that's not the only way of mounting a social movement. Um, there's also something we call astroturf organizing. I don't know if any of you heard that. Have heard that term, but um, when I said it earlier, my husband thought, "Oh, you're organizing to get astroturf on all surfaces in our neighborhood. That's great." That's not what I mean. Um, astroturf organizing is uh, a is the same idea, like building a social movement, except that the 
the leadership, the momentum, the ideas for it, the, uh, the push for it comes from um, very powerful individuals and specifically very wealthy individuals. And so you see that a lot in like charter school movements where, um, you know, parents will be organized to advocate for charter schools, but it's like really wealthy charter donors who are organized, who are doing, who are initiating the organizing and paying for it and, um, and hiring organizers, et cetera. So that's very different than a grassroots perspective, but you see where the metaphor gets pulled, grassroots, astroturf, it's kind of funny, right? Um, and then even something like white supremacist organizing or anti-gay organizing or, or you know, um, any, like all the right wing organizing we've actually seen quite a lot of in, in this era, right? We've seen uh, neo-Nazis marching in city after city. That's collective civic engagement, right? And it's often coming from a very grassroots level. Um, it's just not coming from the perspective of wanting to, to um, address you know, in inequity from a social justice lens, right? Um, so all of these, if you look at them from this perspective of like, is it in school, out of school? Is it youth led in partnership with adults or led by adults? Is it normative or critical? I think these are sort of useful dimensions to think about, about how we're seeing different forms of civic engagement and what we want for ourselves as, as engaged citizens, right? How do, how do I want to be engaged? What kind of, you know, what is, what are my goals as a citizen, right? Um, so I just have like two more quick things, and I know I'm a little bit past time, but I feel like I'm not as past time as I usually would be. So that's a win, right? So um, uh, one thing to think about with collective forms of civic engagement, which is what Ben is going to be transitioning to, is that all collective forms of civic engagement um, use what we call collective action frames to mobilize people around a shared idea. So it's a way of framing or sort of talking about um, a really important issue, something that's important to the, to the folks who you want to be participants in your movement, right, um, that you think will like get people fired up and ready to take risks and ready to, to come out and sacrifice something for the collective, right? So we see it like if we want to go back to the white supremacist organizing that's happening, the often the collective action frame is something like, um, you know, all these non-white people, they don't use those terms, but all these non-white people are, you know, threatening our communities and the purity of our communities. And, um, and they're, they're, you know, and they're taking our jobs and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're hurting our communities and, and they're hurting, they're hurting who we are. They're actually, they're priority, they're priorities and they're going to outnumber us soon, right? So you can see how those, those words, right, they, they're very meaningful to people. They, they fire them up. From the other side of things, you know, from a social justice perspective, you look at immigrant organizing, like pro-immigrant organizing, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who are, who are, you know, pointing out the horrible conditions that immigrants, uh, that, re that refugees are coming into the states and experiencing. They're pointing out the ways in which people are dehumanized by the language of the right. They're pointing out the, the, the value and the, and the, um, wonder of the wonderful things that immigrants bring to a country, right? So these are all different ways of framing an issue so that people feel compelled to act on it, right? And that's what a collective action frame is. And then another really important thing to notice about, about collective action, about collective civic engagement, is um, that sometimes, and very often actually, achieving systemic change requires rule breaking. And sometimes we, it, there, sometimes it's rule breaking that we are we accept and we think is useful, right? And sometimes it's rule breaking that we think is not useful. So, um, you know, it a lot of people sanitized uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's um, history and life, um, and they see him as this like you know great guy who just advocated for all the things that we already have. And they forget that, you know, he also got arrested so many times because he was breaking rules because he would say that those rules are unjust, right? And the same is true for pretty much every social movement that you can think of um, that folks break rules, right? They make, they challenge when they challenge laws or rules or systems that don't seem to make sense um, which, from whichever direction they're coming. Um, and then I'm going to end with just three brief things, right? So tonight we're focusing our discussion on youth organizing, which is one form of youth civic engagement. 
Um, it's a critical and collective form of youth civic engagement, and it can happen in school and it can happen out of school. Um, and it could happen led by youth, it can be in partnership with adults. Um, and, uh, but there are three things that are important, I think are important to sort of remember about, about this form of civic engagement, of youth civic engagement. One is that it builds social capital, right? So when people come together, when young, especially young people, right? When they come together to address systemic problems and to address the root causes of those systemic problems, they build what, um, what is called social capital, which is just like the ties that bind us. And, um, and the, the exponentially rich um, things that come out of those ties, out of those social ties. They create networks of young people who um, become, you know, who, who use that social capital to accomplish goals, right? Um, and related to that, it allows people who have traditionally not held power to, um, to access power in ways that they would not otherwise be able to do. And Ben's gonna talk a little bit more about this, right? And that's, that's from that social capital that they're building, right? Because we're not, I'm not a bank owner, right? I'm not, I'm not a CEO bank owner isn't even a thing. I'm not a CEO of a bank. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a billionaire, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not an ele like a elected official, but the second I get together with all these other people, um, suddenly my voice gets amplified and our voices together mean something different and we're able to push the hand of people in power in different ways, right? Um, and then out of that, young people's relationships with policymakers, um, influential elites, and I would say that even the general public really changes, right? And that's not, I'm not just talking about these specific young people that work in these, that, you know, do the work of these movements, right? It's young people as a whole, right? So the second young people come out and, you know, speak against, um, you know, speak for, for uh, gun reform, right? The second young people come out across the nation <laughs> And, and do that, right, and speak for, uh, you know, in support of dreamers, in support of, you know, educational equity, in support of whatever the cause is, those young people are shifting the way people even view their entire generation, right? Because um, we all know that people my age and older uh, are very quick to, to dismiss people younger than us, right? Not me, I hope not, but, you know, we're very quick, our, our generations are very quick to forget that we were once that age, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to shift this over to Ben. I'm going to pass the baton and he'll go a little bit deeper into this concept of power and into uh, exploring what, what youth organizing can look like. Awesome. And I'll stop sharing my screen too. Thanks, Sonia. I might just pause though and see if there's any kind of clarifying questions or any checking questions before I say a couple things. And then, and I'll try to, I, I actually just have like a smaller specific point to make, but I'll, so I'll try to keep it to maybe five minutes and then open it up for conversation. But are there any clarifying questions that anyone has at this point or questions for Sonia? Cool. All right, well, I'll go ahead. Um, so I, I'm gonna, I, I wanna tell a, a, a short story that I um, often use to illustrate, I think, this issue of power. And it comes from um, a, a real example from Denver Public Schools in Colorado, where students had done a pretty ambitious project. That This was a school-based project, so it was an example from the landscape that Sonia provided of a kind of school-based student voice um, aiming project where, where this high school, actually they were middle school students did participatory action research about an issue that affected them directly. So it w this is not a youth organizing example. This is like a school-based, um, I don't know if you've all heard of YPAR, it's a shorthand for youth participatory action research. Sometimes people call it action civics too. It's where students are kind of thinking about an issue that affects them and then doing research, et cetera. So these students, um, basically they're they're after doing quite a bit of research they were trying to underscore the differences between the facility that they had in their school where there wasn't a gym and so they had gym class in their hallways and a school nearby that had this beautiful gym that was in the town the next town over and they actually took pictures they did research about it they interviewed students and teachers they had vivid examples of how you could be in math class and then you could see a kid like sprinting by while you're listening to the math teacher because they're practicing their 50-yard dash or whatever and, and they did this presentation, and then at the end, they kind of made a pitch for the importance of the school district um, really improving the facility that they all went to. And they were underscoring there was a racialized and class dimension that these were all 
um, Latino students and the neighboring town was white. So they were kind of making an argument too about a kind of systemic racism. So that was the social justice side that Sonia talked about. And, um, and at the end of their presentation, which was about 12 minutes long, um, it was a public comment period during the student board meeting. I'm sorry, during the school board meeting. So I'm sure most of you have been to a school board meeting. There's always a public comment period. When they were done, they said, we want you to support us you know, with this gym. Does anyone have any questions for us? And I'm actually going to open it up to the, the, the chat here. Does anyone have any um, guesses on what the question was or the comments were? From? You can either type it into the chat window or you can um, go ahead and just say it out loud. Cost, maybe? Okay, so, so there might have been a concern about cost. Who said that? I did. Um, Becky? Yeah. Okay, I see Joshua leaning forward. Are you about to type something into the chat? No? Okay. Uh, all right. So, so yeah, maybe they might have said something, hey, you know what? Um, that actually is going to cost us several million dollars. Um, that's going to be tough for us to do. That would have been great if they had done that in my view. Go ahead, Joshua. Yeah. Go ahead. I would say like school population, maybe. Like okay. the amount of students that there is in the school mm -hmm. would probably take a big effect on like if they should put the gym or not. Mm -hmm. you know? Great. Yeah, these are both to me, um, good questions. Yeah, like, well, how many students do you actually have? Should we spend a lot of money to build a gym for you if, you know, maybe your school is much smaller than the other school? So that both of those responses, you know, asking about the population and or asking about cost or talking about cost, you know, to me would have been, that would have been a certain kind of response. And it would have signaled they were listening to what the students had said. But the actual question was, how did you get so cute? That was the that was a question because they were middle school students. So the board member said, I just have one question. I just want to know how did you all get so cute? And everyone then suddenly cheered and laughed and then ushered them off the stage and they didn't have to have a chance to hear anything else. So, um, you know, if you're like me, that would be infuriating because, um, well, it signals again, one of the themes that, that, that Sonia talked about, um, but, I'm gonna open it up again because I just can't help it. Like, what what does that signal to you in terms of how the school board was responding to this presentation? What do you, what do you, go ahead, yeah. Joshua. So, I mean, personally, I would take that offensive. Like, if, okay, if you're the school board, I mean, if I'm coming to you asking you, like, you know, to help my school, mm -hmm. you know, get, you know, better or get better equipment or things to help my school and my students like asking a question like that then that's that's like you taking my school as a joke mm -hmm. you know, that's that's how i would look at it mm -hmm. like you know so i mean that's 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 how i would look at it yeah. i don't know about, so mm -hmm. um Any if i could add something yeah, yeah, yeah I, how I kind of looked at it too is the idea of like marketed student voice, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. please, let's hear your pitch. Let's hear what you have to say, you, you young students, mm -hmm. but let's just hear wrap up and then get to like the more important stuff. Um, and that idea again of like marketed student voice where they just want to look diverse. They want to look inclusive where they don't actually care for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Awesome. So yeah, it's, it's insulting. It might be a sign that, that this is just a spectacle or like, like um, both of you are kind of signaling. It's sort of like they're not taking it seriously. So, so obviously that did happen. Um, and uh, I'm trying to actually find the quote um, that the student said in response because they were getting ushered off stage. And, um, and I'm just going to very quickly see if I can find it. Um, and unfortunately I can't, but I'll find it another time. But anyway, but, but the student did say something like, you know how we got this way? And then he went on to kind of defend how hard they work at the school and how they think about things. Oh, I see also a comment in the chat here that just talks about, yeah, lack of respect and reducing the single comment to, to their age. Um, so, okay. So here's how I'm, 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 why I'm using that story is because what that illustrates to me is these students did awesome work. They really were thorough. They were sophisticated. They had a real policy um, request but they had no power in that situation. So what they basically were doing was they were like, like, I don't know if anyone watches like Game of Thrones or any medieval movies, but like they're basically like showing up before the king or the queen and like 
asking for help, like, please do this for us. But they had no actual power to compel the board to, to do anything. And the, the board did not experience any negative consequences for responding in that way. It was like everyone cheered and thought it was, they, you know, the audience was kind of like proud of the students. Then they thought that was all the students cared about was the spectacle. But, but and, and no one suffered any consequences. Now imagine, imagine if those students who made that presentation maybe had all their parents there, you know, or maybe they had multiple classrooms of students there and they were like, no, we're not gonna accept that, you know? We, how are we gonna generate power so that you can't just dismiss us like that? And that's really what, the, to me, what the origins of youth organizing are, is the fundamental distinguishing feature of youth organizing is that it's an approach that says, we, we can't just depend, excuse me, we can't just depend on the um, sort of goodwill or generosity of adults um, because they're not gonna, they're not gonna give us that unless it's aligned with their interest, we need to develop some kind of political power. And that's really, again, that's what organizing is. I'll do one screen share and then I think I'll, I'll wrap it up. Here's the screen share, but it, it uses an image to make a point. And the question will be, will I be able to find it quickly? Um, but I think I will. Here it is. So um, some of you may have seen this image, but I think it's a good one. So it says, don't panic, organize. And um, I'm trying to just show this one. It just shows a basic image of like many small fish, you know, getting together and being one big fish. And that illustrates this idea of power in numbers, which is central for organizing. And the other slide I can show right now is a little bit more of a definition, um, which just has some of the key elements of it. Leadership by those most directly affected. So that's the youth part, young people are experiencing challenges or struggles or injustices. Often there's an intergenerational element to it. They're partnering with other adults. It's participatory in the sense that it's working with systems to change systems. I'm echoing or quoting from Sonia's thing there, but it's also justice oriented in that it's framing issues in terms of human rights or social justice. And perhaps most important, it has this relational orientation of building a sense of community and face-to-face -face trust. So having said that, um, I will stop and Thank you all for being lovely as an audience and see if um, people have questions or responses. I certainly could say more, but I, I don't want to really because I want to give a chance for some reactions. I'm trying to stop screen sharing. Oh, there we go. Thank you yeah. so much, Ben and Sonia. That was awesome. Um, I took a whole page of notes because I oh, wow. actually so. Um, yeah, but I would love to hear like thoughts from our student participants and any questions that they have and maybe like, if you have anything to workshop, bring it up now. Um, so just opening the floor to whoever has something to contribute. I have a question. I'm trying to start the video. There we go. I have a question. Um, Mr. Kirshner, how did you find out about these students um, in your community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I've, I found out about them because um, I'm trying to think of the, the most concise way to tell this story, um, but here's how it goes. I had an experience leading a participatory action research project with students when their high school was closed. This was about um, 15 years ago. And students were studying the impact of a closure of their high school on themselves and on other students the, the year after that. And they did really uh, phenomenal research. These were high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And um, by participating in that group, I was so persuaded of the value of participatory action research that I, I got a grant to work, start a program where we worked with teachers to do that same kind of work with their students in their schools. And one of the teachers we worked with did this project with her students. So she invited me to come to school board meetings. And we called that critical civic inquiry. I'm gonna put a link in our chat window so people can check out this website. It's in, okay. beta, it's in beta mode right now, um, meaning we're still making changes to it and stuff, but um, since, you're, since we're among friends, I'm gonna share it with you and there might be some cool stuff in there. Thank you. Sure. I, I wanna also just say that if you're looking for youth organizing groups, that what Ben is talking about is something slightly different, but yeah, if you are looking for youth organizing groups, the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing mm -hmm. is a, has like a pretty comprehensive list of groups that they work with around the country. It's like hundreds of groups. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much every locality 
I mean, every city and um, a lot of rural areas also have youth organizing. So um, wherever you are geographically, there are young people doing this work, whether at the high school level, at the college level. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just say, um, I mean, to underscore some of these like distinctions that we're trying to get at um, tonight, like that, yeah, that example might be called YPAR, might be called Action Civics, it's school-based. Generally speaking, in my experience, youth organizing is almost always kind of anchored by a community organization outside of school. And, and that's part of why they, they can generate more power because their jobs are not on the line. They're not at risk for getting fired by the school board or, you know, they actually are able to kind of leverage parents and other students. And they're not, they're not as afraid of a, of a school board because they're independent of the school board. So they're able to do that kind of work. So, uh, Anyway, I put the link to FCYO in there um, too, so people could check it out. Um, I also see that Joshua wrote a comment in the chat about how um, when they ask the Board of Education for things, they look at our schools or our rankings and our school behavior and our school ethnicity. And um, I guess it would be helpful maybe to talk about some ways that we can garner social capital and power, um, if anyone has ideas on that. So I, I, can we open it up to, to you, you, you all participants? I think that's what we're trying to do. We're not gonna answer it yet. No, I was saying like, well, off of what I had commented in the post, I was saying like how, you know, Chicago Public Schools, like for them, like basically on sh like Chicago Public Schools, we are like judged off of rankings. Like we go off of the highest as a one plus school or the lowest as a three plus school. And me personally, I believe that them rankings determine the amount of, okay, what's going on, on my screen? Ooh. Give me a second. Um, okay, so I feel like those rankings, it basically determines the amount of materials that my school or any Chicago public school gets, or probably the attendance boundary too, which is probably unfair to, you know, Chicago public students, you know, and then, you know, that kind of affects us. So, I mean, I like that, that would be like a general good topic to bring up. I mean, about, about it. So like, that's something I want to know more about of like, why is that being brought, like, why is like a school ranking or attendance boundary is something that kind of puts it like it, it puts like a boundary or like yeah it, it basically put like blocks around like what a Chicago public student can and cannot get determining on what school they go to so that's that's something that's really important just a, a, a clarifying question Joshua so is, is part of in part of what I'm hearing you say is that depending on your 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 you know your zip code or your um, your ranking as a school or your mm -hmm. uh, performance. The ranking as a school. The, 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 but that, that they'll have different amounts of power with the school board in terms of being yes, able to speak up and get what they want? Yeah. Because some still like some, some, okay. So for example, if you like, cause I know they, they just recently closed down Hirsch High School be, um, due to lack of students and lack of, you know, a lot of things. And they combined two schools together and they created mm -hmm. this other new Inglewood. So, with like things like that um for example like when you okay now depending on like say if Hirsch was still open and Hirsch high school was trying to get new materials and new and new this and like new things to help the school operate i'm pretty sure the board of education would not pass on that because like because of the way the school operates and because that school barely has any power because of the students and the way they act and because of the type of school it is it's the neighborhood school and it's in the and it's in um and it's in Inglewood. So like, you know, board of education really wouldn't support schools like that. And and that's the problem. It's it's it is more about like, you know, it's more about the power, but at the same time, it's about like, you know, it's 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 a racial thing too. Because more like mainly people people is mainly on the, like on further on the south side of Chicago, like where I'm from, you you would get more black people 
or African American people. So mainly on this side, since it's more African American people, you wouldn't, of course, they wouldn't, because the board of education is mainly ran by people of power and of non-color. So I feel like it's more of a racial thing too, but at the same time, it is a power thing too. So that's why I'm saying like, you know, Chicago Public Schools, you know, we are based off of a label, a, um, a level one, level two, because those rankings are based off of the parents, they're based off of the community, and their um and their feedback on the school and it's based off of the students and their feedback and safety inside of the school so that's what these schools are based off of and that's why these schools certain schools aren't getting enough materials yeah and that's why some students just don't feel safe coming to school too so yeah do you want to say something about that sonia or should we keep keep the conversation going well, I just think you gave, you gave a really good example of exactly how, you know, systems are purposely designed to disempower certain types of people, right? We know that we live in a white supremacist system that's purposely designed to disempower people of color, especially black people, right? Um, and so they've created all these mechanisms that they use to do that. Whether the mechanisms are ratings or if they're like arbitrary, num arbitrary uh, you know, Seat, uh, bodies in seats numbers that they use to say a school is underpopulated or something, right? Or if it's how they distribute, um, how the Board of Education distributes teachers or whatever, right? We know that those systems are in place to, to purposely, you know, give some people substandard educational experiences and give other people better educational experiences. And I think you're right that that's, I think like you've pointed out a, a real constraint, you know? Um, I think the benefit of organizing work is that folks who are in those positions, like in Philly, we, we have a lot of examples um, of times when uh, we had a few years ago, we had uh, like 2012 ish, um, about 50 something schools were slated to close in, in our district. Um, and the excuse they were using exactly the same things that you just said, right? Those schools are, they're underpopulated. There's not enough you know, there's, there's, they're, they're violent, they're whatever, all the things that people say that's like racist code for talking about black and brown kids, right? And, um, and they, you know, they were, they were slated to make, to uh, take a vote and close all those schools. And um, the Philadelphia Student Union, which is uh, a youth organizing group here in Philly, it's a, one of the first of the sort of modern day youth organizing groups, in the nation um, was got like thousands of students to walk out of their schools across the district to protest the closings. And these are like, some of these closings were elementary schools, but these were high school students who got thousands of high school students to leave their schools, knowing that they were gonna be counted as absent, knowing that they were gonna maybe have repercussions. And they walked out of school and, and staged a march on the day of the vote and then went into the Board of Education, I get excited when I talk about this, they went into the Board of, Board of Education meeting, it, it was called the, the School Reform Commission at the time, because we were, when we were taken over by the state, and, and they actually stopped a significant number of these school closings. So I think it, they stopped actually more than half of them. So it was a really big deal, and they, they used allies, they used adult allies as well. So, um, you know, like you said, like, they're not just insulting the students in those schools, they're insulting the parents, and they're they're diminishing the communities and they're making those communities less safe and less and less joyous places to be when they take away schools right so i think you're right on the on the ball and you're right on i'm terrible with these things you're you hit the nail on the head or whatever it is right so, on the money right on the money yeah, i mix them all the time i'm terrible with it right so but but it's you're you're right and this is where the power of organizing actually is um can, can it really gets highlighted you know is that we can there's a lot we can change when when we bring our resources together. Otherwise, you know, you're right. Like the, the Board of Education doesn't want to listen to you or to me, you know, as individuals. Did you want to say one more thing on that? I saw, I saw you putting your hand up, Joshua, or no? I just had an awkward way of ending my sentence. I was just, I'm done, I, but I was muting. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I wanted to ask a question, but do you have a quick response? Joshua, or no? So I saw you put your hand up. I was just going to say, and another thing that, that they do is they keep us locked in with an attendance boundary okay. so that it makes, you know, like 
kids and certain attendance boundary, it makes it harder for those children to go out further than their attendance boundary to get a better education. Like, for example, in Chicago Public Schools, again, Whitney Young, how that's way outside of my attendance boundary, but they'll make it more complicated. That's not a word. More complicated to get into that school um, than it would be to get into a school inside of your attendance boundary. So, yeah. So, so thank you. That is a powerful example. So I'm going to kind of put a question to the whole group, which you're not going to have time to answer in any kind of comprehensive way, but it's something you, you, I would encourage you to think about, and presumably it's already on your mind and could be a discussion for the future, and there's a lot to think about with it. But basically, given the kind of example that Joshua shared, where um, there, you know, and you, I think you're all going to be able to relate to it in different ways. So people may wage power against you just by virtue of your age. You know, maybe you're not eligible to vote or um, you know, you're just feeling like you're not taken seriously, you know, because of your age, and it may be an intersection of age and race. It may be language, you know, it could be religion. There's a lot of different identities and, and kind of social categories that can, that can be, um, that, that kind of white, white supremacist systems are there to dis, disempower. Okay, given that real, social reality, you know, I think the question to think about is like, how do we build power when we're, when structurally we may not have power. So we've kind of introduced this one idea, power in numbers. Um, it might sound easier though, or it might sound easy, but it's actually kind of challenging. What does that really mean? What does it mean to build power in numbers? And what, what, what kinds of numbers matter? And, and once we have the numbers, how do we actually use that to leverage power? I think that's the question I, I kind of curious to hear if anyone has any thoughts on, on what have you learned through your own activism around what it takes to um, get people to, to listen to you and feel like they're going to they're gonna experience consequences if they don't take you seriously, if they don't respond to what you're trying to change. Does anyone have any quick thoughts on that? Anyone who hasn't spoken up yet? Yeah. Or you want to type in a thought? Yeah, um, Sage or Becky? Yeah. Sage, yes. Um, so now when you ask like, how do we make our voices heard? I think it's very important, like we've been saying, you know, power numbers. But I think with that also comes a diverse power of numbers um, because when we're advocating for issues about structural racism, more inclusive education, whatever it may be, it can't just be from, you know, one group of people. You know, if we're, we're advocating, let's say, I'm really passionate about diverse education. So I, I work with an organization local to me um, called the Race Racism, and we do a lot of work with, um, inclusive education mm -hmm. and but if that push was just let's have let's have more inclusive education let's pull for more diverse sources um but it's led by all white people mm -hmm. you know what effect is that truly going to bring you know it needs to pull from all different perspectives mm -hmm. and all different groups of people to have the most meaningful outcome and mm -hmm. at the organization that i work with you know we we have a student task force and that student task force has kids from all different backgrounds, all different races, all different mm -hmm. political beliefs. Um, and we've been able to do a lot of meaningful work in terms of diversifying um, school curriculum. And, and, and we've led workshops and, um, and we've done, you know, intense research around this topic. And I feel that we've been so successful in, you know, hosting these conversations and looking at this issue because we're coming from a diverse point of view. And just to give you some context, I'm from Long Island, New York, and Long Island is one of the most segregated, you know, region, uh, uh, counties, places um, in, in, um, in the U.S. And that, you know, does kind of build this very interesting um, and diverse group of students. And, you know, it kind of, it, it, our student task force is made up of students from all across Long Island. So we're able to kind of take our experiences and kind of produce the most meaningful outcome because mm -hmm. we're, it, it engages students who are affected um, due to structural racist practices. And, and they, they go to a school that has less resources because like we were talking about earlier, because of, again, structural and systemic racist practices. And, mm -hmm. and then you have students who, you know, are living in, in a school district that has all the resources and has, you know, just what a dream school could have. And then you mix that. And it's just, I guess what I'm kind of pulling at is just a diverse community mm -hmm. of students in all lessons, lenses, yeah. whether that's cultural background, socioeconomic, um, and then of course how like the division and segregation of Long Island kind of plays into that. Um, so just to wrap up, yeah. 
asking, you know, power in numbers, but with that power of diverse numbers, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's terrific. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kate and Megan just because of the time, but I love the, where this conversation is going. And um, I'm hearing a lot about coalitions. I think there's some good stuff too, that when you do have the chance to have the mic, like how do you, how, how do you construct a policy demand in ways that are really clear and that are actionable? So, um, but I, but I, I want to respect, I want to respect the time too. Yeah. Um, it's nine o'clock Eastern now, so we should be wrapping up so everyone can kind of go on with the rest of their night, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, but thank you so much to, um, Ben and Sonia for speaking today. Like we, this is great. If we could give them a round of applause, like, um, uh, and I want to thank everybody else for taking an hour out of your day and starting this conversation. Um, so Student Voice just launched um, some new programming that we're going to be doing um, now that there are millions of students not in school because of um, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So first up is this upcoming Sunday, we're going to be having a conversation about what community looks like in the wake of this epidemic. Um, so we would love for all of you to join that and we'll be continuing this kind of conversation there. Um, and if you stay tuned on our social medias and just check your email, there'll be uh, more announcements for more calls, more webinars. Um, we're going to be doing things like this more frequently over the coming weeks to provide space for community and interaction um, when people aren't in school. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben and Sonia. And thanks to everyone who contributed. I just love hearing all of your perspectives and this is really enlightening. So thank you so much. Um, everyone say, stay safe and healthy. Wash your hands, be safe, and have a good Thank rest you of so your much. I was not feeling so great this week because I've just been like really down because of this, but this like picked me up. Yeah, definitely. Just see all your faces <laughs> and, and to have this conversation. So I appreciate having this opportunity. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.